All right. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for this webinar on the potential role of federal regulation in voluntary carbon markets. My name is Don Goodson, and I am the Deputy Director of the Institute for Policy Integrity at New York University School of Law. For those of you unfamiliar with policy integrity, we are a nonpartisan think tank that uses economics and law to support smart policies for the environment, public health, and consumers. And we are hosting this webinar in partnership with the Initiative on Climate Risk and Resilience Law, which is a joint initiative of Columbia Law School's Saban Center for Climate Change Law, the Environmental Defense Fund, Policy Integrity, and Vanderbilt Law School. Before we get started, I'd like to hand things off to my colleague, Erin Shortell, to set the stage for today's discussion. Hello and welcome. My name is Erin Shortell, and I am a legal fellow at the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law. As Don mentioned, I'll be giving a brief introduction before handing things back to Don to moderate this webinar. If you've booked a flight recently, the airline's website might have prompted you to pay a few dollars to compensate for the greenhouse gas emissions from your trip. Maybe the airline's website even proclaimed the airline's commitment to become net zero by a given year. The idea of voluntary carbon markets is to enable individuals and companies to compensate for their greenhouse gas emissions by purchasing carbon credits that represent emissions reductions or removals. These credits are generated by green projects, such as forestry and renewable energy programs. Voluntary carbon markets could play an important role in global efforts to reach net zero emissions. Some greenhouse gas emissions may be all but impossible to eliminate directly, such as certain emissions associated with air travel. Voluntary carbon markets might help us counteract the effects of these unavoidable emissions. In addition, voluntary carbon markets might funnel financing towards otherwise unviable projects that might nonetheless be critical in our efforts to lower emissions. At the same time, Recent reporting has highlighted integrity problems in voluntary carbon markets. For example, voluntary carbon credits might sometimes represent emissions reductions or removals that would have occurred anyway, even without the project. Or the carbon credits may not represent permanent reductions or removals, as when a wildfire scorches a protected forest. Last December, the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission proposed non-binding guidance for certain exchanges that list derivative contracts based on voluntary carbon credits. For context, the guidance would apply only to the small voluntary carbon credit-based derivatives markets and not to the purchase and sale of voluntary carbon credits themselves. Other federal regulators and regulators abroad may also consider regulating additional aspects of voluntary carbon markets in the near future. In its recently finalized climate-related disclosures rule, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission required that when certain registrants disclose their scope one and scope two emissions, they must report those emissions on a gross scale, exclusive of carbon offsets. The SEC pointed to potentially increased government scrutiny of carbon offsets as one reason for requiring gross estimates. In light of the potential promise of voluntary carbon markets and genuine concerns about their integrity, the question at the heart of this webinar is, what role should federal regulation play in voluntary carbon markets? We're joined by five panelists today. Grayson Badgley, research scientist at Carbon Plan. Jessica Garcia, senior policy analyst at Americans for Financial Reform. Holly Perrin, Lead Counsel at Environmental Defense Fund, Robin Ricks, Chief Legal Policy and Markets Officer at the crediting program VERA, and Bella Rosenberg, Senior Counsel and Head of the Regulatory and Legal Practice Group at the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. We'll be monitoring the Zoom Q&A feature so that you can ask any questions you might have, and we'll leave time to cover some of those questions in the second half of the webinar. And with that, I'll turn things back to Dawn to get us started. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you, Erin. So as Erin noted, we will now um, hear a brief introduction from each panelist before we open up the Q&A session to all of you attending uh, remotely. As part of their introductions, we have asked each panelist to kick things off by answering the question at the heart of this webinar. 
What role, if any, do you think federal regulation should play in the voluntary carbon markets and why? We'll hear first from Grayson Badgley of Carbon Plan and then each panelist in alphabetical order by last name. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Grayson Badgley, uh, and I'm a research scientist at Carbon Plan, where I study carbon offsets. Uh, before I begin, I just want to take a brief moment uh, for thanking the organizers for pulling this together and also for the invitation to participate. I'm really looking forward to it. I'll start by saying that I think it's pretty clear that the voluntary carbon market needs additional regulation. Uh, and in order to sort of understand that position, I think it can be a little bit helpful to understand where I'm coming from, and it can be helpful to sort of introduce Carbon Plan. So carbon Plan is a nonprofit that uses the tools of open science and data to improve the transparency and scientific integrity of climate solutions, things like carbon offsets. And our work spans a pretty wide range. It will do things from you know, answering fundamental questions about the climate science and carbon cycle science, uh, all the way up to the analyzing uh, how specific climate programs or policies are designed and making sure that those policies are in line with the best available science. Now, I work on carbon offsets. We've got folks who work on climate impacts. We've got people doing carbon dioxide removal, and we actually even have an open uh, source software team. But the core part of just about everything that we do is transparency. For us, that's transparency in funding, it's transparency in methods, it's transparency in code and software that we write. We genuinely believe that openly sharing data, code, research, that's a really important part of unsticking these tough, wicked political problems of climate change and other, I mean, I think there's other ones out there, but that's what we focus on. And when I look at the industry of the voluntary carbon market right now, I don't think it meets the transparency standards that we need uh, if we actually want these markets to help us mitigate climate change. It's just way too easy to use a low quality carbon offset today to make unfounded environmental claims. To date, most of the risks that come when you use a low quality credit are primarily reputational. That means maybe a raised eyebrow or like a bad news story, but there's really little in the way of real consequences. And I see regulation as a way and a really important tool for raising the stakes of making unfounded claims about how carbon offsets affect the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And again, like that's the science thing. That's what we care about with climate change. We care about atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases. There's probably a lot of different forms that regulation could take, and I think we're gonna get into the weeds on that today. But in my opening, I thought I'd just offer uh, the suggestion that any meaningful regulation, state, federal, self-regulation, we, anywhere we're gonna go, it's gonna require disclosure. Uh, oversight of these markets, no matter the form, it requires that we can trace the link between individual carbon credits the companies that are using them and the claims they're making about how their pollution affects the atmosphere. Disclosure and regulations that allow disclosure, require disclosure, they unlock all kinds of opportunities for oversight uh, and ultimately, I think, will make it uh, much, much more difficult to have things look, look anything like greenwashing. Great, thanks, Grayson. So next up, I believe we have Jessica. Hi, all. As mentioned, I'm a senior policy analyst for climate finance at Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund. We're an economic and racial justice nonprofit organization, which was formed in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And we work in coalitions alongside consumer, labor, investor, environmental justice, and other groups. Big thank you for the Institute for Policy Integrity and the Initiative on Climate Risk and Resilience Law for the opportunity to participate in this webinar and my fellow panelists in advance for the robust discussion um, on this challenging but important topic. Conservation, reforestation, and other related activities are critical to preserving biodiversity and all life on earth, including our own. Nature also plays a foundational role in carbon sequestration and storage. 
If natural habitat loss is not prevented, then all other climate mitigation actions may be for naught. Thus, those nature-based solutions will likely be an important part of a global strategy to reach net zero and store residual carbon, and done well, can provide other environmental, social, and economic benefits. Therefore, finding ways to draw capital to these projects is important. However, to date, carbon credit markets, both spot and derivatives markets, have too often served as a greenwashing distraction for the public and delayed or detracted from companies making the necessary real emissions reductions in their operations, value chain, or financing to achieve net zero targets. In follow-up reporting on the Kariba project in Zimbabwe, exposed last year as producing huge numbers of worthless credits, it said that of, that of the 100 million euros of revenue generated by Kariba since 2011, 86 million euros went into costs and profits assigned to the broker and technical lead, South Pole, and to the project coordinator, Carbon Green Investments. In the end, only a maximum of 14 million euros went to Kariba's communities through cash transfers and infrastructure improvements. This may appear to be an extreme example. However, it's estimated that carbon credit brokers' fees may generally range from 5 to 20%, but that only about 10% of the exchanges, brokers, resellers, and cryptocurrency vendors that act as intermediaries in the voluntary carbon market share their precise commissions and profits. High administrative costs associated with carbon credit transactions, in addition to the well-known transparency and integrity problems for credits, demonstrate that corporate expenditures may be better put to use on reducing corporations own greenhouse gas emissions, including by transitioning away from fossil fuels and investing directly in clean energy. Voluntary carbon markets need much stronger enforceable standards, greater transparency and accountability mechanisms to continue to be used in the way that many corporations currently use them to net out or offset their own greenhouse gas emissions and make claims of carbon neutrality. That being said, while these markets exist and U.S. companies participate in them, including for beyond value chain mitigation, there should be government regulation, oversight, and enforcement where possible. In regards to regulation, alongside partner organizations, we have previously recommended that the Commodities Future Trading Commission generally disallow carbon credit derivatives trading unless and until the integrity challenges within the underlying markets are reasonably resolved. Instead, the CFTC has chosen to provide proposed guidance to designated contract markets. This recent action, while important, is a small step in dealing with the persistent problems within the VCMs, which will require further action from other federal regulators and Congress to address. Other governmental bodies that are playing a growing role in voluntary carbon markets include the US Department of the Treasury, particularly related uh, to recently published principles for net zero financing and investment. As Aaron mentioned in March, the Securities and Exchange Commission promulgated its final rule on climate related financial risk disclosures from public companies, including extensive disclosures around carbon offsets usage and expenditures when they are a material component of a company's plan to achieve climate related targets or goals. At the state level, California Assembly Bill 1305 which was signed into law in October 2023, focuses on voluntary carbon markets disclosure. Any entity doing business in California, regardless of revenue, must disclose detailed information regarding their marketable voluntary carbon offsets on their website. At the international level, in addition to the voluntary standard setting regimes, there's the International Organization of Securities Commissions, which put forward good practices on voluntary carbon markets in, in, in their consultation report, acknowledged that many offset projects are failing to deliver promised emission reductions and some carbon credits may amount to little more than greenwashing. IOSCO also says authorities with enforcement power can play a significant role in preventing fraud, protecting market participants from misleading claims, and instilling greater confidence in the integrity of voluntary carbon markets. All of these players have a role in regulating the sale and use of voluntary carbon credits but cobbling may not solve all the problems within the market. 
Congress should look to establish specific authorities and perhaps look to California as a model. In addition to those I've just mentioned, there are other US agencies that can and should be paying attention to voluntary carbon markets, as we'll discuss more in the Q&A. If VCMs are to continue to play a role in corporate climate action, then transparency, integrity, and trust need to be bolstered. One way to do that is through strong standards, disclosure frameworks, and swift enforcement of fraud or market manipulation, all roles that require federal regulatory action. Great, thank you, Jessica. Next up, I believe, is Holly. Thanks, Don, and thanks NYU and the Institute to, for facilitating the conversation. And um, thank you to everyone who is um, is tuning in. It's really nice to see the faces of the panelists here and, and to see you all joining. I think broadly, federal oversight of the voluntary carbon market could focus on creating safe, transparent, low friction markets that are attractive and trustworthy places to trade, invest, and store assets. I think the more carbon markets look, feel, and behave like carbon, like markets for actual assets, the more accurately they can depict a reliable price for carbon and climate risk and attract critical climate mitigation and adaptation investment. In terms of specific rec recommendations for federal oversight, I might point out that the Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets identified six action areas needed to boost confidence and ensure environmental outcomes at the scale necessary to address the climate crisis. Credit integrity, what became the ICVCM core carbon principles and assessment framework, was one of the six topics for action, an incredibly important topic as borne out by market performance last year, but still only one of six. The other five action recommendations are all areas where limited federal oversight could be helpful. Two of the topics address the demand signal and are the subject of the VCMI credit claims guidance and potentially the FTC green guides revisions, as well as those treasury principles on net zero financing Jessica mentioned. I think there's definitely a role for federal oversight of marketing and advertising directed at consumers and investors, the vast majority of whom we know want to reward products and companies that have a lower greenhouse gas footprint and are investing in um, robust climate mitigation. The spurious claims that have no basis in fact are unfair to consumers that rely on advertisements to make purchasing decisions in a really crowded marketplace and disadvantaged companies that are trying to make tangible investments in decarbonizing and climate mitigation. And in the vacuum of the updated FTC green guides, you know, we're seeing a host of competing definitions of what good looks like in terms of climate claims and how to substantiate those claims. And, and we're seeing a real chilling of investment in sustainability, which I think is not the desired outcome. Plus, Many companies that are investing in sustainability and making claims are national, if not multinational. So the patchwork of state laws and rules from other jurisdictions, um, you know, requires due diligence and um, legwork that isn't helpful. It's not, you know, directed towards sustainability um, investments uh, as it could be with a more consistent, predictable federal guidance on claims and how to substantiate them. So that would be one big area of federal involvement in the VCM. The other three uh, task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets recommendations could be addressed in part by our financial market regulators. Those action items cover market intermediaries. Jessica really touched on the brokers and intermediaries um, very well in her presentation, I thought. Um, market in infrastructure addressing trade, post-trade financing and data, and market integrity assurance. The CFTC's proposed VCC guidance and Environmental Fraud Task Force are really solid steps towards addressing those recommendations. You know, in particular, I'll highlight um, 
They will address fraud and manipulation in the spot market through enforcement. And, you know, I think intend or, or demonstrate an intention to look at all the varieties of white collar crime that can be committed in connection with any type of traded asset. I think we all know from the EU ETS that those white collar um, crim criminals will take advantage of markets, be they environmental markets or not. And so federal enforcement of um, of fraud and crimes is really important to maintaining integrity and trust in that marketplace. Then the, the other elements of the CFTC's proposed guidance that go to some of these task force recommendations are the identification of registries as delivery points and potentially establishing heightened review to ensure that registries have the appropriate procedures in place for tracking transactions. And then also establishing basic definitions and guidance around the characteristics of credits that underpin listed derivatives contracts. I think this is a really important step that's going to not only drive the environmental outcomes that, that Grayson mentioned that are really important and at the root of investment here, but also improve predictability, transparency, and, and provide at least um, a trajectory towards some standardization. And then additional action, I think, from federal regulators, market regulators could be helpful. Uh, they could take further steps to clarify the legal nature and regulatory treatment of carbon credits. Um, really important to build confidence and reduce due diligence requirements and risk in private transactions. Traders absolutely need to know whether they have title to a carbon credit, how to transfer that title, take or give security, um, and the um, treatment of that asset in insolvency and uncertainty around the legal and regulatory treatment deters investment and increases the cost of transactions um, that should really otherwise be going towards climate investment itself. Um, the commission, CFTC and uh, SEC, declined to adopt a definition of environmental commodity in the joint 2012 rule. It may be time to revisit that in light of the new um, products we're seeing on the market. And then a couple of sort of odd points about federal regulation, not specifically focused on our market regulators, that I think are um, important not to lose sight of so that there's an enabling ecosystem to facilitate um, the the marketplace in a um, robust, integrity-focused direction. Um, some sort of financial data collection would be really helpful to assess how well the voluntary effort is going, not to criminalize failure, but as a data point to evaluate whether alternative policy options are needed to meet climate targets. Um, you know, there may be a potential role for the State Department, DOE, EPA, or others. Um, Along that line, USDA, DOE, and a host of other agencies play super critical roles in funding emerging climate solutions and catalyzing those private-public partnerships so that the next generation of potential mitigation technologies evolve into real quantifiable de-risked solutions that are potentially eligible for market-based finance tools. And then while we have to narrow this conversation down, because we only have an hour and, and really amazing panelists for today, the U.S. is not the only important federal regulator in VCM transactions. Host countries that develop clear, transparent regulatory frameworks for VCM and Article 6 transactions are going to be better at attracting capital, speed up transactions, and um, you know perhaps more robustly ensure that those proceeds are distributed equitably. Great, thank you, Holly. And next up is Robin. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much to the institute, to uh, to the uh, the organizers, uh, fellow panelists, and and everyone uh, calling in today. Uh, my name is Robin Ricks. I'm the chief legal policy and markets officer at Vera. Uh, Vera is the world's largest independent uh, carbon crediting program. We've issued around 1.2 billion credits to date from around uh, 1,800 registered projects. Uh, each of those credits represents uh, sort of one metric ton of carbon dioxide reduction or removal uh, in accordance with our in our in accordance with our rules. Vera itself, we're a nonprofit organization uh, founded in the late aughts uh, around 2007, uh, basically as a response to a, a growing sense that uh, what the world was doing was inadequate and insufficient to really truly meet the needs 
uh, of the world as it was trying to address and grapple with the climate crisis. Vera exists on that note fundamentally, uh, and everyone who works there, myself included, we're here because we believe that the world is boiling uh, and we are frustrated, we are concerned uh, about governments that are moving too slowly, corporates that aren't doing enough, uh, and basically the transform transformation that the world truly needs to get from where we are to where we need to be just isn't happening fast enough. This requires, I think, significant changes in patterns of consumption and production uh, across the world. It also requires, frankly, a mobilization and a channeling and a delivery of capital, finance, technology, and capacity uh, from the global north to the global south. That's why we're, we're motivated, and that's what we are trying to build. Uh, the voluntary carbon market writ large and Vera within that has basically tried to has, has emerged to try to fill this massive policy vacuum that has been created. Uh, the voluntary carbon market exists at its core as a way of quantifying outcomes, the outcomes of interventions aimed at reducing or removing emissions, uh, and is all about as well allowing for such outcomes to be basically denominated uh, and, and made transferable uh, to those who are willing to use it. I do want to emphasize at this point the voluntary nature of the, the VCM. We often focus on the second and especially the third word of those of that acronym. This is a voluntary mechanism to date, and it's voluntary because governments haven't moved fast enough, uh, and it's voluntary in the sense that whether it's the the uh, the countries that are participating, whether it is the uh, projects that that have have these, whether it's the the, the corporate buyers, uh, this is a voluntary uh, system right now. We long for the day when this will become regulated, uh, but we are still in that voluntary phase. To answer the question about what we sort of see as the role for federal regulation in this area, uh, a few things I want to say. The first one is that we strongly, strongly like and encourage regulators to take a more muscular approach to fraud and market manipulation. From our position at Vera, we can see these things happening. We report them to local law enforcement, but there's a limit to what we can do and what we can achieve in that role. Uh, we are not the police. We are not able to do everything that we that frankly is needed. Uh, the nature of carbon credits, these are abstract you know, instruments that represent counterfactuals. And like I think the previous panelists had said, like any sector, it can be susceptible and vulnerable. So we call upon regulators to take a far more muscular approach to fraud and market manipulation. Uh, with respect to the, um, the other aspects of this, we would caution uh, against an overreach uh, of federal regulation, uh, given the nature and the emerging nature, frankly, uh, of this sector. This is still a relatively young sector. It is a sector that is still innovating, that is trying new things and trying basically different ways of, um, well, basically uh, in its design and implementation. Uh, to that end, we absolutely do agree that there needs to be uh, stronger regulation with respect to secondary market trading, and we would encourage and welcome uh, and see what that, that looks like. And perhaps other panelists have views as to sort of how exchanges, et cetera, may be regulated. Um, with respect to the regulation of the underlying quality, uh, Vera notes that there are a host of sectoral initiatives that are emerging, uh, whether that's the ICVCM, the VCMI, and there are others, of course. Um, and those are emerging and are providing that sort of technical and really scientific expertise uh, that we believe that this sector needs. Um, so I will conclude by just talking a little bit about transparency. Uh, yes, transparency is vital. Transparency is important. And I think that the first panelist was correct to note that. And I think others have noted that too. Um, I would make this observation. Uh, that data transparency is a priority for Vera and I'm sure for the other standards as well. Uh, if anything, the there is transparency. It's just that the information is up and it perhaps is so dense, it is so great, it is not as usable and not as accessible uh, as it could be. And this is a known problem and it's one that we are trying to address. Uh, so I would just uh, emphasize that yes, transparency is important. We absolutely believe in it. Uh, the VCM and certainly Vera was basically it's an analog creation or an analog construct for a digital world. Uh, and we are still seeing that transition uh, taking place right now. Uh, I look forward to this discussion, look forward to the questions. Uh, I think that the issue of regulation and how do you appropriately regulate a growing, innovative, 
in its basically infancy slash toddler slash adolescence, what's the best way? And I think it's uh, going to be quite an interesting exchange of views on this panel. Thank you again for having me. Great. Thank you, Robin. Um, and next we have Bella. Hi, everyone. I'm Bella Rosenberg. Um, I am Senior Counsel and Head of Regulatory and Legal Practice Group at ISDA. First of all, I'd like to thank the panelists for participating in this webinar, and I, I would like to thank um, the organizers for, for inviting me to speak um, at this uh, on this very important topic. Um, as you may know about ISDA, but just we are a nonprofit um, trading organization, trade organization. We comprise of a very diverse membership. Our members range from banks to exchanges to asset managers, um, various market participants, varies in size. Um, so we um, look at issues, regulatory issues from, you know, perspective of um, diverse, um, diverse market participants. Uh, we've been focused uh, on the developments in the uh, voluntary carbon space for a while. Um, this is one of our, um, you know, agenda items. Um, and so in part, so part of my regulatory work portfolio um, involves working uh, with our members uh, on this important issues. Uh, when I'm thinking about a regulation, federal regulation of uh, voluntary carbon markets, I would like to start before just emphasizing that I just recently read in the Financial Times that the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, for Net Zero estimates that $125 trillion of investment is required to achieve um, the Net Zero transition and 70% of which will need to be supplied from the private sector. So against this backdrop, uh, we have to think about how important the role of voluntary carbon markets and the role of private participants in the transition to net zero. Um, when I think about federal regulation, we, we believe that it is very important that we have a measured principles-based regulation that ensures that these market participants operating in a transparent ma manner and these markets operate um, uh, um, in a transparent ma manner free of abusive behavior, fraud, manipulation, or greenwashing. Um, it's also very important for the federal government to provide guardrails to make sure that participants understand what conduct is permitted and what conduct is prohibited. It would uh, boost market participants' confidence in these markets and thus leading to increased trading and liquidity in these markets. And uh, we believe that the CFTC has the experience with regulating exchanges, uh, proved that a principles-based regulation works well, and we think that a similar approach um, can be applied to voluntary carbon markets. Um, I also would like to emphasize that we're at ISDA uh, working on different ways on how we can help um, improve the transparency of this market and standardization is a very important component of this market. So we at ISDA uh, published voluntary carbon uh, credit definitions. Um, it's a booklet that provides a set of standardized terms for the trading and retirement of voluntary carbon credits in the secondary market. So market participants can use it for spot option and forward transaction. Again, it's a, a step to try to standardize, standardize, standardize um, uh, and, uh, provide some sort of standardization uh, of these markets. And finally, um, I would like to emphasize that these markets are voluntary. So we have to be aware that you know, we don't have compliance markets. So we have to provide incentive for market participants to participate in these markets. Over prescriptive regulations will disincentivize the um, the participation and kind of defeats the ultimate goal of uh, having voluntary markets. And finally, because these markets are global in nature, it's important that we um, in the US have consistent regulations, or at least consistent approach with uh, foreign regulators to make it um, as much as easy as possible um, to, uh, to trade uh, credits um, cross border. I'm gonna stop here and, and thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Bella. And thank you, everyone else, for those uh, very helpful introductions and for helping to set the conversation. So just as a reminder, the Q&A uh, chat function is available if anybody wants to submit uh, questions. We've got several in there already, but I may jump in first with um, a few questions sort of pulling on what I've heard 
from you all. And the first one I wanted to talk about, because I think it touches on several themes that you've all landed on, which is um, one of the recurring debates and some people who um, have been opposed to federal intervention, federal regulation of the markets have argued, for example, that the markets are not yet mature enough for uh, federal regulation and that you need to spend a, a bit more time to allow the markets to mature and that maybe the market will land at more sort of, say, standardized terms um, through sort of just uh, coalescing around particular expectations of what, say, is a high integrity uh, carbon market. At the same time, um, these have been around for quite a while now, and we still see that one of the issues with carbon markets is that they are very bespoke. Um, or sorry, uh, carbon offsets are very bespoke. There's over, you know, say, 170 different types of carbon offset projects, which might have different features that would factor into how people would value them or price them differently. So it may be different, say, than like cotton or oil, which is more standardized and has few features that make it more susceptible to that standardization, which is why, for example, uh, to Bella's point, you see more robust derivatives markets because the underlying commodities themselves are more standardized. So a question to pose to you all is, and is this a chicken and egg problem? Um, are the markets uh, not yet mature enough for federal regulation? Can federal regulation play a role in standardizing so that it, it it kind of moves things along. So for example, the CFTC's guidance lays out considerations that the CFTC believes makes for a high integrity carbon offset. And I know, for example, Robin had touched on the idea that maybe it is still a young market that is still maturing and maybe you don't wanna jump in too soon. So let me pause there and see if others have thoughts on this question about market maturity and whether we're at the right stage. And if not, can federal regulation play a role in kind of maturing the markets and helping um, accelerate that standardization. I guess I can I can start with this. Um, I'm not sure that um, federal regulation can help with standardization. I think it's uh, what the federal government can help with is providing incentive for market participants to enter this market. And the other aspect that uh, I think the federal government can be very helpful is creating a governance structure so that all market participants know what's right, what's wrong, what are the procedures for trading um, this contract. Um, I don't think the federal government necessarily needs to know about you know, each individual product that is traded, right? What, what kind of credit is traded? Because you know, I'm just looking at the at um, the uh, derivatives world, the Commodity Futures Trend, uh, Credit Commission. You can't say that you have an expert in grain or an expert in metal. They have general knowledge. But what the what Congress gave the federal government, the CFTC, is the authority to create governance rules in place, framework on how trading should take place. You know, you know what's right. You know what's wrong. You know how to keep records. You know that. You know what uh, there are a list of uh, violations that's prohibited. You know potential penalties for committing violations. So there is an organized sort of marketplace um, that, if, and if market particip participants have a clear notice of what's right, what's wrong, and how they should trade in this market, I think it will bring more market participants in this marketplace. Yes, Robin. Yeah, I mean, I might, I might just add that regulation. Two things. One, it needn't be sort of one and done. It is something that some regulation can be introduced now and other regulation can be introduced down the road as the market further matures. And so I think it's, I don't want to sort of say, say it's a binary, do we regulate now or or not at all? I think it can be something that's sort of incremental or stepwise. I just want to really emphasize that we see no reason to delay on introducing regulation for fraud and market manipulation. These are real concerns. And we call upon regulators to exercise their authority in this area and to take a more active role. Great, thanks, Robin. Uh, Jessica. Yeah, this is this is certainly a, a tricky question on on judging the the maturity of a of any given market. Um, you know, as you mentioned, corporations have been directly purchasing like have been directly purchasing carbon credits since the nineteen eighties, and the voluntary market for voluntary carbon credits has been around for more than two dec decades. Um, and yet integrity issues have, have persisted. And so I, I certainly think that regulation, it is a time for regulation. And this question, you know, to your point about uh, how diverse the market is, I, I think we will continue to see challenges if, if 
if our if a goal is to expand the market um, or to even stabilize the market, as as we've seen challenges with with demand in recent years, um, re require some of these these mechan these regulatory mechanisms uh, and for increased integrity, transparency, and other pieces that market participants are demanding in order for the market you know to mature. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Holly? I really like what the other panelists have already said and would just add that this might be a very North American concern, to be honest, in a global market. Um, I, I say North American because Robin is Canadian, um, but I do hear um, this a lot in American you know, regulated entities. Um, but a handful of jurisdictions, Singapore and the Abu Dhabi global market come to mind immediately, do we see the potential for some limited federal oversight as a way to attract capital and catalyze market maturity in their jurisdictions rather than as a drag on an emerging market? And, you know, as Robin pointed out, our own federal market regulators are constantly evaluating the markets for new risks, growth areas, and development around new products, and can and do adjust their approaches as needed as a market evolves. So I think it, it might be um, time to see oversight not as a hindrance, but as a help. And there are other jurisdictions that are doing that. Um, and in order to remain competitive and, um, you know, remain in the global market, um, I think regulation may may be helpful. I mean, it, we have a major challenge with trust that, that the other panelists have done a really good job articulating and bringing in the checks and balances to create a healthy integrity-driven market could be a win-win-win for companies and climate and the communities that, um, that investment go towards. Great, thank you, Holly. Uh, Grayson? Yeah, maybe to just take us in a, in a slightly uh, different direction, I, I also think that there's potentially a role um, for thinking a little bit more deeply about regulation of the, the types of claims uh, that people are making using these credits. I, you know, I love this idea of, of capitalizing uh, or you know, um, bringing capital to these markets, you know, you know, developing uh, renewable energy and things like that. I think one of the things that we're, we're starting to realize is that we, we actually can't avoid emissions to net zero, right? Uh, not putting fossil CO2 into the atmosphere because you build a solar power plant doesn't necessarily mean that you stop building or burning coal somewhere else. So at the end of the day, uh, we need to transition from a market where it's really dominated by a lot of these sort of avoided emissions, sort of saying we could have lit some stuff on fire, but we're not going to, to a world of where we're actually actively managing uh, atmospheric CO2, which is what we really need to do if we're going to have any prayer of stabilizing global temperature. And so uh, trying to think about how we're going to, um, uh, you know, so making a claim of, of sort of I've neutralized my effect on the atmosphere, that's a really strong claim. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of room for there to be misleading claims, uh, given just how the, 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 the sort of physics of the atmosphere work. Great, thank you, Grayson. And I think that's a really great way to segue to um, one of the first questions in the Q&A from the audience, which is two parts. I'm gonna take the second part, which is about the existing legal tools for enforcement, especially when the carbon offset might not be in the United States. And I think one thing I'll build on there is I think a lot of people have focused on, on disclosure, on greenwashing, on false claims, and, um, and that, arguing that going after fraud is maybe a key component of this for addressing these problems, but also, say, bolstering faith and confidence in the market, which could potentially then attract more investment. But a question then to pose to you all is who, and we'll, we'll focus on a U.S. federal regulatory lens, who is best positioned to enforce and go after those fraudulent claims? I think that's been one part of the puzzle that has been really difficult to solve because uh, there's a lot of overlapping regular, federal regulatory jurisdictions, but there may also be gaps. So maybe I'll pause there and see if, if the panelists have thoughts on who is best positioned to go after these uh, claims of um, you know, improper, or improper claims regarding carbon offsets. Uh, Jessica? 
I mean, I think um, a, a lot of us are familiar with the Community Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, and, and for those who aren't, um, they have, it's an agency that has expressed its broad authority to address fraud and market manipulation in the spot market. And it established the Environmental Fraud Task Force in 2023. Um, so the task force and enforcement division of the CFTC, you know, should and, and can definitely investigate any reporting or research which indicates fraud manipulation or integrity concerns in the unregulated voluntary carbon credit spot market and results of subsequent investigations by the CFTC or from the Department of Justice or other agencies, domestic or international, that indicate fraud or other integrity or liquidity problems within VCC spot or derivatives contracts can be used to inform you know, additional guidance from the CFTC on on some of these contracts. Um, so they're they're certainly an entity that is that is entering into this space, and and hopefully we will not see that they are the the only one. Um, but I think as these markets have garnered more attention, both as opportunities, but also as posing significant inherent problems, um, that more federal regulators are trying to figure out what what role they can play, but. Um, it's exciting to see that that the CFTC is um, recognizing some of these, you know, enforcement authorities. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, so I'll take another question, which I'll also paraphrase, which I think gets at maybe a higher level um, question, which is, you know, what should the goal of the voluntary carbon market be? And uh, basically, you know, how should we think about the role that the voluntary car market should, and maybe somebody would argue should not play in a transition to net zero? And how does that affect uh, federal regulatory oversight? I think this is a tricky question because as many people have noted, it is a voluntary market, which has emerged on its own. Um, but uh, taking this question from the panelists and sort of tweaking it a little bit to ask, you know, maybe how do we, how should we think about the role that carbon offsets should or should not play in a transition to net zero, and how would that for inform federal regulatory oversight? Well, I'm going to um, try to answer that. I think one uh, when we're thinking about it, the role of voluntary carbon markets, the way I view it is it's a good source of financing, right? It's you basically get corporates, you get private sector to finance. Pro I'm simplifying that, but you basically get uh, private sector to finance projects that they cannot directly participate in. You know, if you have your corporate that can really engage in the activity that will reduce or remove um, emissions, at least they, you know, buy credits that indirectly financing this product. So this is one as one answer, one first answer to this question um, as to how, because of that, how I view that, how um, voluntary carbon markets should be regulated. Um, um, I agree with Jessica that you know the CFTC has authority over uh, spot markets. The CFTC confirmed that um, you know this this credits are commodities, and therefore the CFTC has has jurisdiction over them. Uh, with a little caveat, it has jurisdiction over commodities that directly impact derivatives that are listed with the underlier. It's not all commodities, only the derivatives that are, are the underlying of the derivative futures contracts. Um, but they are in a good position because I think they are uh, they know what um, uh, principles based regulation is. And I think this is something that's very appropriate for this sort of new nascent market. Um, it also fits well because there are so many uh, market participants and, you know, there are eight, um, entities like ICVCM um, who work on the quality of this carbon credit. So I, I view them as a sort of a self-regulatory organization. So the CFTC is used to regulating this self-regulatory organization. There is a good, I think, dynamic between how much CFTC regulates, how much, you know, exchanges regulate, SROs regulate. So I think they are in a better position to... Um, to take on this responsibility. Great, thank you, Bella. Uh, Robin. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a huge question, and I, if I can sort of try to take a to, to an attempt at answering that, I would sort of approach it in the following way, and I'll I'll zoom out a little bit here. 
The VCM, I think one of its overarching goals is frankly to provide an alternative source of financing to communities, to projects that where there is intense pressure to emit. And that intense pressure can be political, it can be economic or otherwise, big industry, big agriculture and so forth. The VCM is an instrument, a mechanism that is operating at scale, I would argue not large enough, but at scale uh, that provides a, a means to sort of mobilize that finance and direct it. Uh, is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Uh, but that is sort of a, a real goal is to basically help finance the transformation. The other overarching goal I see is the VCM. And VCM, I would argue, is actually becoming hopefully a little bit inaccurate. My hope is that this becomes just CM or we're even in a pre-compliance uh, carbon market at this point, um, because that's where we need to get to. We need stronger regulation. My hope is that the voluntary carbon market is basically promoting a culture or is building political will by those who are involved in it uh, to get comfortable with the notion of uh, understanding emissions, reducing emissions, and addressing them. It's voluntary right now. My hope is that this will become regulated, uh, but it is about building constituencies of support. In our role at Vera, we are frequently in touch with people from financial institutions, from corporates or otherwise, super smart, super keen people who might otherwise have no interest in this space whatsoever. But by, by tying this to an asset class, by tying this to some sort of mechanism, it is something that people are beginning to sort of throw their their intellect and so forth towards. And I think we, we shouldn't discount that when we talk about this, this, this market. Um, it is a market that is bringing in people who might otherwise not be interested in these. And I think we, we do need to acknowledge that. All that said, this is still, I would argue, in early days and we need to get from where we are to where we need to be pretty fast. Great, thank you, Robin. Uh, Jessica? I, I certainly think we're all in agreement that the goal of voluntary carbon markets is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and create ways for corporations to apply available capital in an efficient way. However, I, I continue to wonder if carbon markets are the best use of capital and other resources to achieve the ultimate goal of slowing down or halting climate change, or if those resources would be applied in other ways. Uh, we don't have the problem of not being able to see the forest for the trees. I think, in fact, that has largely been where the problem has been in seeing the forest, the big picture goal, without appropriately valuing the trees, the, the detail of the carbon projects, where the largest concerns are around integrity and local impacts. Um, so there's sort of two categories that I that I think about in some of these you know critical details. The first category of critical detail is that finance projects should not be undermined by violations of human rights, land rights, and labor rights. Unfortunately, too often, voluntary carbon credit projects have failed to adhere to social and environmental safeguards and protect human rights, even those that consider these criteria. Recently, Carbon Brief mapped the impacts of carbon credit projects around the world and found that over 70% of those they reviewed resulted in harm to indigenous populations and or nearby communities. Um, which is unacceptable. And the second category of, of sort of critical detail and has been discussed already by panelists is in differentiating types of projects because not all projects are, you know, create the same results. There is wide variability in the permanence, additionality, prevention of leakage, and ultimately the actual emissions reduction capacity of a given project. Not all of the disclosure regimes differentiate between avoided versus removed emissions and not all would allow carbon credit buyers or investors to identify the actual project or projects being financed, um, they will need that information to judge the credibility of carbon credit usage and related claims being made to the public. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, so the next question I see up in my queue, which I might also just slightly modify, the question is, is there already a good example of federal regulation of voluntary carbon markets? And I think I might tweak it just a little bit. Um, we focus a lot on the CFDC, and I might ask if people have thoughts on other regulators, say the Federal Trade Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission, and whether we're seeing any examples of maybe good federal regulation coming from those actors or other actors. Uh, that maybe I'll, I'll elaborate and say that I think many people probably know about something called the Green Guides that has been put out by the Federal Trade Commission. And I think uh, many people have been hopeful 
that an update, an impending update to those green guides could provide more uh, clarity regarding particularly uh, greenwashing claims and to address um, and ensure that consumers are buying what they think they're buying. Um, but we are still waiting for those to see. But um, the FTC does not have the same sort of enforcement tools that other regulators do. And I think this is one of the themes that we've at least noticed, I think it's coming out in this discussion here, is that there are certain limits to each of the existing federal regulators, uh, to each of the federal regulators' existing authorities. I think Bella noted, for example, that yes, the CFTC has spot authority, but it is limited because it has to be tied to a commodity that is uh, you know, tra tradable or connected to a derivative, um, even within the derivative market. I think many people in the comments have recently filed noted, for example, that the voluntary carbon market derivative market is itself extremely small. And so the derivatives connected to those uh, futures contracts are actually quite uh, small in terms of the overall market. But um, I'll just maybe pause and see if others have thoughts on whether maybe EPA, other federal regulators might have a role to play or if we're seeing any good examples of actions from those. I, I, you, you mentioned the EPA, so I'll chime in. And I, I, one of the things I'm sort of continually curious about, if there's actually instances where carbon markets are maybe getting in the way of uh, really easy regulatory uh, wins. And I think that sort of like, if we look at kind of, I, I often thought that if we kind of look at sleepy corners of the offsets market, where there's not a lot of project or credit activity, that those might actually be places where we might be reached for some other regulatory tool. And one thing that comes to mind with the EPA is landfills. Landfills are a pretty significant source of methane. Uh, there's some carbon offset projects where you get paid to install, collect, and burn gas. Uh, but it's, again, it's a pretty dull corner of the market. We've seen regulators in California, and we're seeing regulators in Washington state, you know, take really interesting um, actions to sort of uh, tamp down on the amount of methane that they let uh, landfills uh, emit. Uh, one of the nice things about landfills is the technology is pretty simple and straightforward, I should say, and mature. Like you need some pipes, a vacuum, and you've got to have a flare at the other end. And so you know, maybe there's some wins there of where you can you know, make a meaningful uh, change in the amount of methane, the meaningful change in the amount of local air pollution, uh, and you know, also get some nice wins for the atmosphere. Great. Thank you, Grace. And I see, Jessica, if you um, have maybe a short comment, I see we're almost at time. Yeah, I was, I was hoping someone else would jump in because I've already spoken oh, quickly, but I will very quickly say I think there's a, a potential role for the U.S. Department of the Treasury um, to issue, you know, potential potential future guidance um, in follow up to their net zero uh, principles, but uh, more specific to, to carbon credits. Um, I think the SEC is clearly going to probe the usage of carbon credits by public companies. Um, in, you know, as a result of its recent climate disclosure rule, SEC might also look into buy side companies like publicly traded timber companies. Um, and, and ultimately, I think legislation could be introduced that gives one or more agencies, potentially like EPA, uh, more explicit authority to, to monitor environmental integrity and potentially certify credits within the U.S. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And I see that as we're at time, there were many more questions we weren't able to get to. So it suggests maybe we can have a, another discussion in the future. But um, for now, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists. This was an excellent conversation. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today.